Okay, I think it's time to get started. So I would like to well, greet you all. Welcome <coughs> to Marcus Jagemar's PhD defense. He will defend his thesis and title, as you can see over there. Utilizing hardware monitoring to improve the quality of service and performance of industrial systems. So my name is Bjorn Lisper. I am a Marcus main supervisor, so I'm going to chair this event. So first I would like to present uh, the people involved. So we have our faculty opponent here, Professor Håkan Grant from the Academy Institute of Technology. We have a grading committee who decide on the outcome, consisting of three people. We have Dusan Patina Maggio from Lund University. We have Dusan Vlaso from the Royal Institute of Technology and Dusan Gesa Hirvisala from Auto University in Finland. Uh, I would also like to thank my assistant supervisors, Morris Benam from Mela Dalen, Sigurd Dell from Eriksson and Andreas Almendal from Eriksson. And also we should acknowledge uh, the support that these researchers have gotten first from uh, the KK Foundation through the ITC Research School and also by Marcus employer Eriksson since he has been able to do this thesis during his working hours. So, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, this uh, PhD defense and uh, giving me the opportunity to act as opponent uh, for uh, this thesis by Marcus. Uh, I will try to give a general overview over the thesis and uh, Marcus have, has done mainly three major contributions and I will try to put them a little bit in perspective and in a slightly popular way maybe to explain what he has done. So um, the first area where he has uh, made contributions is in the area of performance measurements. And uh, the context for his work has been telecommunication systems, uh, which is very, very complex systems to start with. Uh, consists of uh, processor boards with multiple processors on uh, we put them together in cabinets and uh, large systems uh, so many different components large uh, amount of software running there and during testing and development uh, it could be quite a messy environment to to work in both hardware wise and also software wise and um, of course, there are a lot of factors uh, related to, to this uh, subject. And when it's a very costly system, it's systems that cost hundreds of man years to develop. And uh, that, of course, generates high costs for, for the company. Uh, there are also often very long lead times, and uh, the systems live for a very long time in, in production. I mean, they, they are being run for maybe tens or Year, tens of years and, and even longer. Uh, but uh, developing them means that we still need to, I mean, need to have systems that comes into the, out to the market. And if we have uh, long lead times in the development process, uh, then it might lead to, to lower profits for the company. So we'd like to shorten the lead times. And uh, performance, of course, is important. Uh, because uh, functionality sells, but uh, performance uh, sells also. And the worst thing is that low performance will uh, result in that people don't want to use the product. So uh, performance is important. And uh, testing the performance as well as functionality is tedious and takes a significant part of the development time. So can we make something to, to sort of uh, take a big sort of, sort of take on, on this? And uh, that's slightly a little bit what Marcus has tried to, to, do, to do. He has tried to do, develop good measurement tools to help the developers and testers in the development process. And it's also important to, to do smart algorithms in the system in order to get good performance. So um, if we go slightly a little bit into what he has done. Uh, 
some of us have seen this guy before, I guess. Uh, and uh, that is a little bit what uh, is the high level view of performance. We stand on the outside and measure the performance of a system. For example, just measuring the execution time or response time. And uh, if we're lucky, the system performs very fast. This is typically an Ericsson system, even though it's Porsche. I mean, Ericsson systems are also fast, costly, exclusive. Uh, but uh, what if when we uh, measure the response time, the system behaves like an old T Ford? Then it's not enough to just stand on the outside and measure the execution time. We must do something more. And uh, that's where Marcus comes into the picture. Because what he has done is to go into the details about how can we look into the car, in this case the telecommunication system, and put in measurements probes measuring detailed information. For example, for a car it could be the revolutions per minute in the, in the, the motor, air pressure in the, 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 the wheels, uh, different aspects of the uh, air flow around the car and all these kind of small details that sum up the whole picture of the performance of the system. Why it goes fast or why it's not. So that is the, the contributions in the first sort of area. Putting in detailed measurement tools and how to use them to understand the performance of systems. The second big part here is uh, on adaptive message compression. And um, in uh, most systems, we have uh, entities that communicate. It can be computers, it can be just software entities that communicate with each other. For example, here between A and B, there is a channel that we can send messages back and forth. And as long as we have Low utilization of the channel, it goes very fast. I mean, we have space in the channel, so I mean, round trip times will be under control. Problem arises when we put in too much, too many messages into the channel. There will be congestions, long latencies, and yeah, everything goes much slower. And that that's not what we want to do. We want to have good performance. So, okay, one reason here is that, of course, we have too much traffic into the channel. Can't cope with it. So, what if we try to reduce the size of the messages using some kind of compression algorithm? That sounds like a promising idea because then we get rid of some of the amount of traffic, and we get space in the channel again, and traffic can, can flow as we want. There is, however, one small uh, thing to think about here. Reducing the size of messages, compressing the data, costs something. There is no free lunch in this. So we must spend CPU time on compressing the messages. And that is the key idea. Because the reason why, when we get the congestion in message channel challenges, that usually means that the CPU cannot work as fast as it can. It, it runs out of work because it waits for the, the messages to travel back and forth. So we have idle CPU cycles that we can spend on compressing the messages. So instead of just letting the processor standing idle, we can use it to compress the messages and then reduce the load on the communication channel. And uh, if we have low CPU load, we have plenty of idling time that we can spend on compressing messages. We can have a, then a costly compression algorithm that costs a lot to compute but is efficient in compressing the messages. On the other hand, if 
the CPU load is relatively high, then mm, okay, then we can't compress as much. And uh, again, that's where Marcus comes in. He has devised an algorithm that dynamically can adapt the compression level in relation to how much CPU load there is in the system. So taking, uh, taking into account how idle the CPU is, it can dynamically adjust how hard we can compress the messages. Really nice idea. So finally, process allocation and scheduling. Uh, and um, if we look at this uh, telecommunication system from a very simplified perspective or very simplified model, then we have a number of uh, CPU cards that consists of number of processors with their local cache, cache systems to bring data close to the processor. We have memories, etc. And then we put several cards in the same rack, get the bigger system. And uh, if, if we put several cabinets together, we get a really huge system, which contains many, many processors. And it's in these small processors that we now have very many of that actually do the work. So um, the problem that we are facing is, given that we have a uh, pretty high number of processors, we're talking about hundreds of processors, we need to have some way to uh, put the work on these processors in a good way. And uh, there we have two problems that we need to address. First, allocation. In essence, where to put the different work tasks on which processor. And then the scheduling problem. When and how are we going to execute the work that we have put on a particular processor? And uh, since we are working with these very, very large systems, uh, with many different activities, both dependent and independent tasks. We have changing conditions on workloads. I mean, the load varies. And uh, that leads to that the decisions must be taken dynamically during runtime and in some kind of automatic fashion that are adapted to, to the situation. Additional complexity is that uh, in many cases, we also would like to have certain response times. We need the system to answer to our requests in, uh, within a finite time. So that adds significant complexity, actually. So uh, therefore, we need to have mechanisms and algorithms that dynamically during runtime, measure what's going on, measuring the load on the processors, for example, the behavior in the memory system, and depending on what's happening in the hardware at each particular time instance, dynamically change the way processes are scheduled on the processor. And that is, again, what Marcus has done. He has developed algorithms that dynamically adjust the load on the processors to guarantee certain uh, uh, levels of, of services. So with those words, I leave it to my, Marcus to, to talk a little bit about the details. OK, the floor is yours. OK, Marcus, your turn. Thank you. <coughs> <clears throat> I have a bit of a bad throat today, so please bear with me.
Great. Uh, thank you for the, for the introduction. It's, uh, it's almost like I don't have to do this. You know. <laughs> we can just refer to the previous speaker. Um, this is the Ericsson headquarters. Uh, it's, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to mention the title again. But uh, one thing that is important is that I've been to quite a few of, uh, of these PhD presentations, and I tend to get lost in the, in the theses. So just to make it easier to follow, if you see a yellow circle, <coughs> it is a page reference. It will be on all, on all slides. It's a page reference. You can just <coughs> go to that page, and you will find the details. Anyhow, uh, what I have really done is up here. <coughs> How the heck can we make our telecom system both faster and more cost efficient? That's a translation, basically. <coughs> I think it's more, uh, it's a bit more telling, but not as academic. Okay, uh, I'm going into the errata. Um, this, this was the thesis sent to the grading committee. It's, uh, it's apparently not, uh, it's apparently not okay. This is how it should look like. So you can change it if you like. Nothing has changed in the content. It's just the, the front page. <coughs> uh, I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> the picture is drawn by my daughter. She's nine years old. And uh, it's a bit choppy or, or uh, well, you don't have it there. But it's a bit um, pixelig in Swedish. I'm not sure about the English word. Uh, that's uh, like a metaphor for message compression that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, I'm not sure that we should go through all the, all the uh, ROTAs. Uh, there's some spelling mistakes, uh, at least as far as I have found. And there's a correlation value on 187, page 187. <coughs> That's incorrect. There's a typo. It should be uh, zero instead of one. My background. Started at Ericsson about uh, year 2000. I've been working or studying. Um, affiliated with MDH since uh, 2011 with the ITCC Research School. Uh, I'm not going to introduce my, my supervisors. They're over there. Um, there was a presentation earlier. Um, I have also supervised a couple of master theses and, and uh, bachelor theses. I love black and white photography. I really love it. It's wonderful, especially with analog cameras. That's like a contrast to my work with all the digital things. I also like wooden boats. That's our wooden boat. This is what you should remember from this presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, what's the problem that I wanted to solve? Basically, the demand for capacity in the network has grown quite rapidly, and it's like a very drastic uh, requirement from, from customers, from end customers, that <coughs> data usage is growing, uh, everybody's downloading apps, people want to watch uh, movies on their mobile phones and so on, and uh, how can we meet that requirement? That's basically the, the number one question we have stated over here. While at the same time, we should uh, maintain the systems that we have. We cannot just scrap the old systems and, and well, it would be nice from Ericsson point of view just to scrap the old ones and get new systems. But the customers wouldn't really agree to that. So we need to support the old systems while still providing more capacity. So uh, we have formulated a number of research questions to meet this, or a hypothesis first. <coughs> can we monitor the uh, resource usage of our system and find some performance areas? It's a, it's a quite big scope. And we divided it into four research questions. Can we monitor the hardware usage uh, and software performance without seriously affecting the system that we, we monitor? <coughs> can we replicate the load of a production system 
on a test node, that would be interesting from the testing perspective, as Sorkin mentioned. Can we improve the communication performance? That's what quite important in our, in our system. Uh, and we would still like to keep a, a CPU performance cap on that. Can we, um, can we change or allocate and schedule processes in a more efficient way so that we get higher performance and still meet the quality of service requirements that we have? So there's four uh, research questions. If you look at page 56 in the book, it matches these four main research areas that we have. The sizes of the circles do not match the, the contribution or the work. It's just like a, they have the same size. I think it's more work here in this latter part than, than the earlier part. And the smaller circles, they are uh, contributing papers to, to each research, research area. So it's just a way to visualize how they, uh, how they contribute to the, to the overall research areas. And you have a timeline. Started 2011, uh, worked for a, a number of years, had three uh, parental leaves. Um, and finally, 2018, we're at this meeting or this uh, presentation. So there's a number of publications. <clears throat> these, uh, these publications is the fundament of, of the thesis itself. There is also a, a number of re somewhat related publications and really pub uh, related publications. Uh, I've tried to just indicate the green ones, they are sort of uh, related. As you can see down here, the green ones contribute to the research area. And the blue ones are less related. Quite interesting papers, according to me, but uh, they're still uh, not related to this thesis. Now I'm going to touch on, on pretty much the same thing as Håkan did. Uh, this is the target system we've been working with. I'm not going into this because Håkan did it so so quite uh, thoroughly, but uh, there's uh, thousands of cores in the system. This is the old system that we work with. It's still in place, it's still working, it's still deployed, but we have moved into newer types of systems which are more uh, distributed and uh, will be cloud-based. Yeah, you see in this picture, it's about the, the lab. It's a mess. That's typically the case, it's a mess. What's quite interesting is to see that the size of it, imagine if you want to monitor something here. It's a challenge. If you correspond it to having a Raspberry Pi on your, on your desk, that's, I mean, that's challenging, but, but still it's, it's uh, not the same challenge as finding out where to do stuff here. <coughs> Further, uh, I think Håkan also touched on this. The system is, uh, is quite big. There's no acceptance for downtime. It must be operational at all times. We cannot reboot it, at least not that often. We cannot do anything that monitors the system and have a performance impact. It's, uh, it has a very long deployment time, decades, before we can change it. So it's a bit of a, it's an infrastructure system rather than a, than a server system. If, because if you have a server system, you can typically rip out one of the servers and replace it, and other servers, servers will, will take over that part of the system. It's not always this case uh, in, in Ericsson telecom systems. Uh, so, down to the real business. What have we done so far? <coughs> we go into the first area, the first circle. <coughs> That's resource monitoring. And this is a very vital part in my, in my PhD. Um, I have used the performance monitoring unit extensively throughout my research. It's a part of the CPU where, which, can, which can measure hardware resource usage for free. 
So you program it, you tell it to monitor the number of cache misses, and then you can forget about it. You can run your program, and the hardware will automatically collect information about the things you want. And then you can read it back. So it's a very efficient way. It's not very known to, I mean, in, in general. Not all people know about the PMU. It's present in basically all CPUs available, ARMs, Intel, power pieces, and so on. So it's a very, I would really push for using this. It's a very good, very good feature. And as I said, it's cheap to use. That's from a performance perspective. Uh, Perf in Linux uses it, of course. And to the left, you can see all the things that we can actually monitor. Uh, for a power PC, for example, you can monitor pipeline stages. This is really important if you're, if you're into low-level stuff, understanding how a program executes. But I've mainly looked into the uh, cache usage here. Our performance monitor can also monitor system-level performance, which is, uh, describes how well the system uh, executes. Okay. I'm just quickly going to go through how it works. This is the timeline down here. Um, There's a sequence diagram with a, with a number of uh, actions. So we start by getting an interrupt, a timer interrupt, and then we can read the performance, the PMU, which is actually called a PMC in PowerPC, but it's the same. We can read the PMU and we can store the measurements. And then we get the next counter set, the next PMU set we want to program, and we program the PMU, and we return. So this is a cycle that can be repeatedly executed when we sample stuff. This is how Perf does it, and this is how we do it. It is very efficient because reprogramming this part, it happens quite rarely, and it's, uh, it's very, it uses very few cycles. So <coughs> what's the use of this? If we look at pure monitoring, we can build uh, like a CPI stack. Uh, that's a cycles per instruction stack. It's, uh, I would say that it's an indication of how well a program executes. It's quite powerful, but it has its limitations. So the blue stuff here, the blue part of the, of the bar, that's actually the effective work done by a process. The rest on top of it are losses or waste. Because you have the PMU to measure, you can measure how many times a process gets a cache miss, a branch miss, and everything. You can build this kind of stacks. And you can see that this is not a very, it's not a very efficient program. I can't really say about 25, 30%. It's really crappy, basically. So you by, just by monitoring, you can find out the program if it's executing good or bad. Quite powerful. This is also how we found out that our target application, our telecom application, is memory bound or cache bound. It's not depending on basically the CPU or the floating point unit or so. You build like a stack like this and you can see uh, what hardware resource it's, uh, it's bound to, depending on. <coughs> so, uh, the next step. That's the second circle down there. Load replication. Uh, if we start on the left side, we have a production node. We start by monitoring the execution or the hardware usage of this production application. This can be at the customer site if we get access to it. Uh, then we can we can build a, like a log or a database of how it executes over time. Then we can use this information. I will not go into detail uh, in this presentation, but we can use this information to, uh, with a test application and the load generator, we can reach the same hardware resource utilization as the production application. Typically, you, do, you have a test application that tries to replicate the behavior of the real application, that's fine, but it doesn't necessarily have the same memory footprint and so on. 
and memory footprint that can cause secondary effects like a lot of cache misses. I mean, it will increase the message processing time. You can miss deadlines and so on. So this introduces a step of more uh, realism in a test. <coughs> and this is how it looks like. Uh, to, the, to the left, you have the production system. I guess it's too small to see, but uh, this is the level one cache usage or instruction cache, level one data cache and level two data cache percent cache misses, uh, miss ratio. And using only the test application, it looks like the middle stack. It's not similar at all. And if you have the load generator together with the test application, it looks fairly similar. So this rightmost stack and this leftmost stack. So the production application only looks fairly similar to the test application with additional generated load. So this is how you can detect certain types of problems. This is how we detected a performance problem related to an errata that caused additional cache load. <coughs> and the third, uh, third area, uh, message compression. <coughs> well, just monitoring the system made it possible to see that the message performance was not optimal. We could have a, a saturated message, um, messaging system, but still CPU cycles to spare. The CPU may not be totally loaded, but we still had a, a congested communication network. So why not use these CPU cycles to compress messages and get higher throughput? And vice versa, if, we, if the CPU was bothered with other stuff, we could actually reduce the number of compressed messages uh, to, to, uh, to let the CPU execute other services. <coughs> so uh, we devised this, uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it was quite naturally implemented. We changed the API, the messaging API, send message and receive message. And we implemented a message compression functionality below the API. So the applications did not have to change anything. They used the same API as before. They didn't notice anything. <coughs> and our uh, automatic message compression uh, API, it selected the best compression algorithm among a set that we implemented. It's easy to add another one if you feel like it. Just drop in a new compression algorithm. <coughs> but the key thing is that the API, it automatically evaluates the performance continuously and it selects the best one at a particular time. So if the, the content of the message stream changes, another algorithm should or can be selected if it's better, if it provides better performance. And uh, this is uh, one of the results. The, the black line, <coughs> the black line is, is our uh, automatic message compression API. And the blue line on top, that's the uncompressed. And the average message round trip time, lower is better. So you can see that in the beginning, it takes a while for it to, to gather enough information to make a, an intelligent decision. But when it makes this decision, it's, uh, it's progressing to a much better solution. The bottom line is if I as a human know that this compression algorithm is the best one, I can select it directly. That's, of course, the, the best solution, but not necessarily the, the most convenient one. So uh, our, the cost of our um, selection mechanism is, is between the black line and the lower one. And the fourth, this is one of the this is one of the patterns that's uh, also included in this thesis. It's a uh, allocation and scheduling framework in a very condensed form. It measures the performance of processes running on a system or several system rather, and it sends this to a global decision engine that can make that can make 
intelligent decisions on where to put or where to allocate processes and how to execute them. And then it deploys it back and the system can iterate over again. I will go more into the, the subset, which is the leftmost part of this circle, the allocation. Uh, and one of the key ideas was to, we cannot, really we cannot really allocate processes purely on their resource usage. We want to map or correlate the resource usage towards the performance. And performance is typically decided by or, or described by a system level metric, number of packets processed, number of customer handled, something like that. And the resource usage is typically handled or described by cache misses or uh, floating point instructions or something like that. So uh, we took the Pearson correlation coefficient between each low level metric uh, we calculate the Pearson coefficient between the low-level metric and the system-level metric. <clears throat> and then we sorted it, the result. So basically what we came up with, uh, if we had two processes, A and B, process A can, for example, be 292% correlated to the, uh, the level one data replacement, which is a metric in the PMU. is 92% correlated to the system performance. You can see that in the graph. It's fairly correlated. And we can see process B is about 90 or 91% correlated to the same metric. That's an indication that those two processes should not execute on the same level one data cache cluster. If possible, we should move them apart. Then they get better performance, right? So this is the result then. If you process A was level one cache bound, process B was also level one cache bound. So we try to move them apart. We try to allocate them to different cache clusters. In Linux, this would never happen. It, was, it will throw them out. And it, depending on the CPU usage, it will try to make it more <coughs> fair. So it, it's, a, it's a very different approach towards the, compared to Linux. <coughs> and the second part is uh, scheduling. That's how and when to run processes. We have pretty much the same scenario. We allocate A and B on different cache clusters. Like this. But still, even though we did that, we have a couple of processes P here, evil processes. And they execute on the corresponding core one that shares the cache with, with A. So we want to police them, make sure that they don't affect the performance of A. <coughs> That's scheduling. So now we came up with, with an hour, another patent down here. <coughs> it's, uh, the idea itself is, is fairly simple. The PMU is a counter. It counts the number of accesses to a resource. Whenever it reaches its maximum state, it generates an interrupt. Uh, that's how it works. So what if we... When we, pro when we swap in a process in the scheduler, we program the PMU uh, from its maximum value, we subtract a quota. This quota is decided by the decision engine before. So, so uh, we subtract the quota from the maximum value and then we swap in the process and then let it run. So it will run until the PMU reaches its maximum um, maximum value where it will generate an interrupt. Which means basically that you swap in the process and you don't have to care about it. You just let, let it run. And that's, uh, there's no cost associating with that. It's completely for free to run. <coughs> so in this case, in, in this um, in this figure, we can show that P1 can never affect, or there's a lower uh, probability that it will affect the performance of P0 because we can, we can set a quota on certain resources, like cache, floating points, or whatever. Yeah, this is just for keeping you awake. Uh, this is a, a, 
this is the implementation of the allocator and scheduler. <coughs> the movie uh, is a, a high definition movie. It has a lot of data. Uh, and in the background, I run a, a number of leeches, as I call them. They basically access memory. It's like memory strides. So they saturate the memory bandwidth. So <coughs> let's see what happens. It will begin with running in SRA, the shared resource allocator, that's our scheduler. I'm shaking, you know, because I'm filming. But still, if you look at, uh, apart from me shaking, uh, you should look at this uh, earth. It, it rotates quite smooth, apart from the shake. And now you can see down here, I'm moving the application into the standard Linux scheduler. Do you see how it chops? It's really chopping. It's missing a lot of frames because it doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't get the data it wants. And you can see this figure here, that's a number of lost frames. It's losing a lot of frames because uh, it does not get the data it needs. And now I'm gonna move it back to, to our scheduler and it starts to work smoothly again. It's zero down there. That's really, a, it, it's a prototype implementation. Apart from the crappy filming, <laughs> it's a, it shows basically the, uh, uh, how it works. <coughs> and this is another experiment where uh, we're measuring the, uh, the average message round trip time of our test application. And we have a lot of leeches in the background trying to, trying to destroy the <laughs> execution environment. This is just the test application without any leeches in the background. It runs nicely and smoothly down here. And then we introduce these kind of leeches. That could be services if you translate it into a real application. It could be any service that intermittently tries to execute. It gets quite choppy and, and fluctuating. And you can see that the performance, there's a radical performance drop in our application. <coughs> and then we move our application into the new scheduler which is, um, it's, uh, it's enforcing uh, a quota on the caches. So now you can see that it's executing quite smoothly. And that's good from our perspective. The difference between here, uh, this line and this line up here, that's the cost of the, um, of the enforcer which is, by the way, completely unoptimized. It's, uh, it's implemented in Linux, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a product yet, not an official product. Yeah, threats to validity. Um, of course, we have tested our techniques on one system. That's, of course, difficult. Uh, we should have gotten more telecom systems, <laughs> but that's probably a bit difficult. We could have tested it on uh, other types of system, systems, naturally, but, uh, it's, um, but still, we have, did it, we have done it on, on one system. It's a limitation that we know, uh, know about. <coughs> Regarding the monitoring and load replication, we have not really verified that the develop time is shortened by finding bugs in early stages, but I think it's, uh, it's stated by, by Boehm, for example. So, so we haven't really confirmed that. Uh, we have also used synthetic taste data in some corner cases for the message compression. Uh, we can also use a different type of metric. This is the feedback I got from some uh, paper presentations that we could have used uh, uh, different system level metrics instead of the, the round trip time. We could use bandwidth or something like that. Uh, the reason for using the round trip time is that it was used previously in our system. It, it was a well-known um, well definition for us, but it was, it was not a well-known definition for, for academia. So that's a limitation. <coughs> <coughs> and the sh allocation and scheduler, well, we have only implemented it in Linux, which was a feat by itself. 
it's a massive job to implement anything in Linux kernel, I can promise you. Uh, and we want to compare it with the CFS scheduler because we're bandwidth, we're interested in the bandwidth, primarily not with the RT scheduler. So we haven't really looked into the execution timing and so on. But we could do that, of course. And I think we should have made more measurements with leeches, like checking how much, uh, how they are affected by being controlled. Conclusions. Well, uh, I just listed the research questions and the hypothesis here and tried to answer them. We have devised the resource monitoring method. We have deployed it actually in the production system. So uh, at least testers use it nowadays. Uh, and the load replication. We have implemented it, we have tested it, and it, it works. Um, and the message compression, it's also implemented, it's also working. Uh, we haven't really deployed it yet. And the same thing for the uh, allocator. It's working in Linux. Um, it's not a product as of yet, but maybe it is later on. So I think we have at least answered the research questions and, and uh, confirmed the hypothesis. The summary, this is the last slide. At least some small dent, <laughs> yeah. Several publications, and I think the industrial contributions are quite quite nice. Personal journey, of course, it's always good to, to learn stuff. <coughs> a lot of academic knowledge. I think this is the key outcome for me, at least, a structured way to investigate problems and hopefully solve them. That's a key outcome for me. And also, I really like to be part of the uh, being uh, to to work between academia and industry. That's a really fun place to be. <coughs> and of course, it's been great fun. That's the most important thing. Thank you.